Yeah. Um, I hope you can see all the slides. Yep. We're going to change topic a little bit now and talk uh, about the MI metric construction. Um, again, it's, I'm not going to give you a course on MI metric construction. I mean, the 30 minutes wouldn't be enough. And uh, we have lots of material online, which you can watch, recorded presentations and so on, and also further links. I just want to give you a brief overview about some important aspects. And more importantly, I want to relate that to um, how you would then use these things in SURF. Um, so it's more a kind of introduction to translate MR terminology into kind of SURF um, objects. If you have any questions, then please just um, interrupt me also during the talk. You don't have to wait then, until the end. Um, <clears throat> so um, you've seen that before, right? Um, we talked about that uh, already at the beginning. We have a scanner, we have an acquisition model which describes whatever happens inside there. And in MRI, we get an acquisition data and it's also called um, case-based data. We call that um, the case base, uh, which is basically a spatial Fourier space representation of our object. Um, then we do imagery construction and then we can get our image data. So you can see a, a standard T1-weighted image of the heart. Now, just briefly, what, what happens inside the scanner here? Uh, well, the scanner is one big magnet. That's basically what most of the hardware in, in there is. Um, we have different field strengths. Um, people decided that there are certain clinical field strengths. So field strengths they decided uh, or they agreed on are useful, usually 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla. There are higher field strengths, such as 7 Tesla. And there's even a clinical scanner now, which is at least um, see it labeled for uh, brain imaging. But there's actually also kind of um, more work now towards lower field strength. So in, in theory, of course, you want the high field strength because high magnets mean lots of signals, a good SNR, but also a lot of things get more complicated and also gets quite expensive. And so the trend nowadays is actually to go to lower field strength um, to 0 0.5 Tesla or even lower, um, just to make MR um, available to, to more people. The other important component in there is the RF coil or so called body coil or excitation coil. So we have the body inside of the magnet. Um, in there, we have hydrogen nuclei. And these um, uh, have a magnetic moment, and their magnetic moment aligns with the magnetic field. They go into an equilibrium state, but of course, that doesn't give us a signal. So we need to kind of perturb that. And so we apply an RF pulse um, with a RF coil, so RF for radio frequency, because the frequency is in the range of 100 megahertz for um, uh, these um, three Tesla, 1.5 Tesla magnets, um, which means we get a response. And the response is uh, so-called magnetization, which is the sum over all the magnetic moments inside of the body. <clears throat> depending on RF pulse or what we do, to do something, it's not so important what, but we can con control that. Usually it's a pulse because we perturb it once and then we kind of watch what happens afterwards. And this is when we acquire our signal and this is how we get our MR um, signal. As I said, it's a sum of everything. Um, so we need to do some spatial encoding in order to get the image out of there. And this is done with so-called gradient coils. These are these three coils shown here. Um, and they um, do the spatial encoding of our signal. So in, in very simply put, um, they vary the magnetic field as a function of space. And this means that the magnetization here um, also changes depending on where it is, or the contribution from different points to the magnetization changes. Um, and then we can uh, change this encoding. This is then what fills our case space, and then we can do the imagery construction. <clears throat> because these um, gradient coils, if you write down the math, um, basically just do a Fourier transform of our data. So we have the spatial encoding, we have these three gradients. Um, for a 2D image, we would have the X and Y and then just excite a single slice, but we can also do 3D imaging, then we have another Z gradient. And this determines how we sample our case space. So with this, we can acquire data like this. So we, we require discrete points um, in this so-called Cartesian case space where all the points have the same distance to each other. Um, and um, then we can do the reconstruction, but we can do also anything else. This is one example, it's the most common pattern, um, but you can also do radial um, lines through case space, you can do spiral, you can do whatever you fancy. Um, it's a whole research area out there, just on designing these so-called trajectories. So the way we sample case space given this gradient cross. Now if it's case space, if it's all nicely Cartesian, if they're all um, 
equally spaced, we can simply do a fast Fourier transform and you get that image out of there. Um, so this is kind of the most simplest um, MR imagery construction. Um, and it's also the most commonly used ones. Um, and one, one reason why people then like this type of sampling scheme is because you can simply apply the fast Fourier transform. You don't have to do any iterations, a direct reconstruction. As Chris mentioned before, in this case, noise is not really a problem in our image. So we don't have to um, take, so noise in MRIs is uh, Gaussian, but it's quite low compared to for most sequences for our um, image data. So we don't have to take extra care of that. Um, of course, if this is then not the case, if it is not um, this nice Cartesian sampling, we can't just do the Fourier transform. and also some other aspects, but we'll get back to that uh, in a second. So we have this pipeline here from scanner, our case-based data and reconstructed data. Now, what does this look like in SURF? Well, as mentioned before, it's acquisition model, right? So this describes whatever happens between scanner and our raw data. Then we have the acquisition data. This is the case-based data, which we have. And then we have an image data object, um, which describes in our final image. Yeah. And if we can write that here in a very simple form, um, we can say that we have an acquisition model applied to our image, and that's our raw data. And that's similar to what Chris has shown it before for PET. Now, a little bit about the raw data. Um, so um, each vendor, of course, has, have, they have their own raw data format. Um, but lucky enough, um, a couple of years ago, um, people got together and they decided on kind of an open source common uh, raw data format. It's called ISMMRD, a long name, but the ISMMRM stands for International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine and then RD for raw data. Um, and um, there are converters for the most common um, scanner. So the Siemens to ISMMD converter, which takes in a raw data file coming from a Siemens scanner and transforms it to that. That's probably the most, um, yeah, the, the most well-tested um, converter. There are converters for other um, vendors, also one for um, GE, um, but it also usually sometimes requires um, some additional software you need from the vendor because they are open, uh, their raw data formats are not open source. So you need some, some uh, agreements to sign with them. Uh, and some also don't support all the raw data or all the scans you can do in MR scanner. Um, so one strength of MRI is also that you can have lots of different ways of scanning, um, but all not all of them are yet supported here. But people are still working on that and the, the, the support is, is growing. And here's also a link again, what we have on SURF, uh, some explanation on that, but of course you can also go to this GitHub repository and get some more information there. And it also has uh, its own Python support, so you can also load them into Python, for example. Um, so what I want to do now is look at a few of the notebooks and just explain to you what, what aspects of our image reconstruction you look at, so to get a little bit of an overview. Um, I'm mainly going to look at the MR ones. I'm going to show a little bit of the registration. Chris has already mentioned that before. And then um, lastly, I will also show you, or we continue basically the synergistic one where I show you a simple reconstruction um, for PET, MR, and CT um, data. So here in the MR, you have this, this list here. They're also labeled with these letters here. And this is also kind of the order you should go through them if you have never really done anything with MR. But in any way, that gives you lots of information and lots of those that the later ones then um, use um, stuff from, from the ones before. So there is some kind of uh, uh, structure to that. So it makes sense to go through them in that order. Um, so the first one is the fully sample one that I will show it to you then also later, but um, it's just um, yeah the basics again, how to connect to Gadgetron, what I've shown you before, right? How to start the server. Um, and a little bit also on Python programming and uh, so um, and how to use that in this um, Jupyter notebooks. The other thing is then also what the layout of this raw data is. So what does it actually look like in, in this file? How is this organized and how we can do the reconstruction? As I mentioned, you have this acquisition data. This is the case-based data um, and it consists of a list of acquisition objects. Um, and each acquisition is basically one uh, readout of frequency in corner okay, X line. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's kind of this almost the small. So, of course, the smallest entity would be a single data point. But usually, we don't acquire just a single data point, but we acquire kind of uh, 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 like a few hundred, or hundred, or two hundred, or three hundred of those in a very short time frame. That's called one readout. Um, 
and um, this is kind of usually the smallest entity um, which we look at in, in MR reconstruction. And so there's an acquisition for each one of these readouts, and then you need again a couple hundred um, or 100, 200 um, in order to fill a 2D case space or um, even more if you want to fill the 3D case space. And they just sorted there in, in one long list, basically. You have certain functionality, you get some information about that, and um, you get some more um, uh, also things to do in, in, in the notebook than there. But again, what I've shown you before, right? Just use the help function that gives you then much more information, how this is structured, what you can do with that, and so on and so forth. So keep, keep just typing that and um, uh, to, to learn more what's going on there. Um, then we have another one which is a case based filter. Um, so this is basically just um, applying a filter to a case based data before you uh, reconstruct that. Um, the main idea of this notebook is to show you how to interact from surf or surf objects to other Python functionality, in this case, NumPy. So how can I basically get the case based raw data out of the surf object? How can I um, modify it and how can I put it back and continue my reconstruction? Um, so you can take a reconstruction pipeline and then you want to just try out some quick things um, in, in Python code, um, then this is a good starting point for that. Um, and um, the next one is called call combination. Now we're getting back to this causativity maps, which I also um, talked to you about um, before. Um, so I don't know if, how many of you have already had an MRI exam or have been present in MRI exam, but this is just an example for an MR scanner. Um, again, this huge magnet. Um, and in there, you have this RF coil and these gradient coils. But what you have in addition are additional receiver coils. So here you can see the back part of a head coil. And here you can see the head coil being closed over the head of a patient. And so these additional coils are used for signal reception. Um, so they are basically our detectors. Um, the reason why we have those is because they improve our SNR, because we can put lots of those small elements um, around the region we're interested in. So if we have a, a head exam, we put the coil around the head. If you have a cardiac exam, we have a special cardiac coil, which we put uh, around the heart and so on. Um, and as the name suggests, um, receiver coils, so it's plural, so it's not just a single one, but there's small, there are multiple coils in there and small coil elements, which again help us in SNR because um, any noise which comes from the body, is basically incoherent. And so we can, uh, yeah, um, basically average it out if you combine the signal from these different coils. Uh, and uh, a modern head coil, for example, has around 32 um, individual receiver coils, um, which then can combine. Of course, similar to what we've heard before in the total polyped, right? It also means you have 32 different case bases, so you have 32 times more data compared to a single coil. So you always have to keep that in mind too. Um, and so also in SURF, we have an object called causativity data. We put some case-based data in, usually it's the, this information about these different coil elements is calculated from the case-based data itself. So the one from our clinical scan, but you can also do reference scans. Then we calculate these coil maps and these coil maps describe kind of the sensitivity profile of the different coil elements. Um, so a little bit like in, in PET where we have to get the sensitivity of our detectors and find out if any detectors are broken. Here we also have to kind of find out um, this, uh, the sensitivity of the coils relative to our object in order to be able to combine the data then from the different coil elements in the most optimal way. Um, and in this um, uh, notebook, you will also see an example of how to combine this data if you don't know um, these coil sensitivity maps, it's also possible, but it usually helps if you do know them and it gives you a better image quality. Then they have some parameters you can set and then you just calculate that, but everything, how to calculate them and everything, it's all implemented in service, all happening in the, in, the, in the background. So the main thing you need to know is that you need to do that and you can do it from the um, case-based data from your scan. Um, so this is kind of the basic overview. Now we're gonna go more into image reconstruction. So this is a, kind of the equation for uh, an MR signal. So um, we have here the case-based data called this Y and K is our trajectory. These are the case-based points where we've acquired our data. Then here we have our object X, CN, this is our coil sensitivity information, also as a function of space, of course, and for N different coils. This is the Fourier encoding, this is done by our gradient coils. Um, and then we have the integral over the entire volume of our body. And we have some constant term here, depending on the B0 field. 
Now we can write it a bit more compact, what I've shown you before, right? Is this y is just a of x, y times x. And then we can do um, some image reconstruction, right? Either trying to invert that or try to minimizing again the distance between um, the acquired data and um, the image and our acquisition model applied to this image, the current estimate of our raw data given our image estimate. And here again, we will at least square um, because we have Gaussian noise in our um, in our raw data. And once we have something like this, um, we can also um, add additional penalties. And I'll just show an example here. Um, so what you see here is a um, 2D acquisition. Um, if you see a little look carefully, you can see something moving here in the center. This is a beating heart. So it's a single slice through the heart. It's a real-time acquisition, which means the heart is beating, but it's also moving up and down because of breathing. What you see here on the right um, is then a temporal line plot. So think of one line through the heart uh, and then over time. And you can see kind of the small variations and this is the heartbeat. And then you see some larger variations of the overall image. And this is then the breathing motion. Um, and this was acquired with a radial trajectory. So we acquired data along radial lines um, and we have very few lines per image. So a lot less than we would actually need for re reconstruction. That's why you can see all these streaking artifacts. But you also see that they change over time, which means that we use a different kind of trajectory, so a different set of radial lines for each of these um, real-time images. Otherwise, these streaking lines would be more or less constant. So this reconstruction is kind of inverting this acquisition model um, and then applying it to the case-based data and then um, getting our X out of there. So a little bit like the filtered back projection we had before. Um, now we can do an iterative reconstruction where we really minimize this and then we can already improve. So reduce the streaking artifacts and get um, uh, already a better um, image estimate, but we can still see there's some artifacts in there. So here we are using now the fact that we have these different receiver coils and they uh, apply some additional spatial encoding. It's not so important, but um, it can be solved with an approach like that. Or we can add additional regularization. And here we add another um, total variation penalty. Um, and then we can further improve our image quality and get um, reduced the streaking artifacts even more. Yeah. There's just one example of, of how you can um, basically from the same case-based data, same raw data, get different outcomes depending on the acquisition, uh, the reconstruction algorithm you choose. All right. <clears throat> and this is, if you want to see a little bit more on that, then there's also notebooks on that. So there's an unassembled reconstruction notebook uh, where we um, go through some of those. And um, uh, we basically have this, this uh, minimization here of, the, of, of this um, L2 norm um, and uh, use a conjugate gradient method for that. And what you basically need is you need the acquisition model. And we have seen in the previous notebook how you can construct that. Um, and then you need the backward operator of that, but you've all seen that that's already implemented. So when you have the acquisition model, you have the forward operator and you have the backward operator. So you have everything you need in order to write down such a gradient approach. And in this example, this notebook, you will see how you can do that either using already existing functionality or actually just writing it yourself. Just a few lines of code. Yeah. Um, then yeah, we have some advanced reconstruction where we then, um, uh, can use um, uh, other optimization algorithms. In this case, we use SciPy and use um, uh, optimization algorithms from there. You see how what you need to provide to the SciPy functionality from SURF in order to use that. Um, and the last one here, which is also kind of important, is how to create undersampled case space. Um, so that um, sounds trivial in a way, but usually. Um, often you have kind of, or you, you can have a fully sampled case space, and now you want to test your, your reconstruction algorithm. So you want to undersample that, so reduce the number of case space points to have, like what we had before with these radial streaks, you get the artifacts and you try an algorithm which gets rid of that. And here in this, it's shown how you can, for example, create a pattern like this, where you leave out every second line, or where we have just a low resolution image and so on. Um, this is more for something then, if you want to go to the next step, and really um, develop your own algorithm and need to test that, then you can um, look here how you can take kind of a fully sample, which is then your reference, undersample it, and then try to get back to the image quality of the fully sampled one. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Uh, multimodality, we have talked about that, right? Um, so we can have the PET MRCT ones soon. We'll also probably then add um, a spec to that. Um, and um, the advantage of SURF is, and we've still together, that we can do them all together and do them all in a very similar way. This is what I've showed you in the first part now uh, at the beginning. And so this was the introductory, which either went through then with the acquisition model one. Uh, and now we're going to look at also this gradient descent one where we take this acquisition model one step further. Um, yeah, it's objective function. I will show you that. Um, then um, you also have um, notebooks on image orientation. Um, it's especially important when you have multimodality like PET and MR. Um, so you need to make sure that um, if you want to do something together with those, or even just overlay them, that you have the correct orientations and voxel sizes and the same um, origin and so on. And we also have some um, notebooks on that. Um, there's also some end registration. Um, Chris has also shown you that too, right? Um, so we have also functionality in there to estimate motion. So here you can see an example of um, breathing motion and here an example of cardiac motion. And this grid here is an emotion field which has been estimated um, based on this data um, using um, the, the functionality here, uh, which is um, provided by Nifty Reg in, in SURF. And the brain where we've already seen, right? So also find some more um, information there. It's a great way of getting some quick, some, some data, um, some simulated data, image data uh, for testing. So you have the different modalities and you have different subjects which you can download and then import into your, into your notebooks. Yeah. Um, just before I go I'll switch over to the notebooks, um, just keep in mind that um, MR raw data is complex valued. Um, and my image data is complex. Um, so you need to keep that in mind when plotting data, but also in your image reconstruction, especially when you interface, for example, with SciPy, because the optimization schemes expect real value data. Um, and also if in MR we can have 2D or 3D images, but even if it's 2D images, it's still a 3D object in shape. So they have the set component is, is just one. Uh, just, just something to keep in mind. No? All right, um, before I switch over to the notebooks, um, are there any questions? Let's, uh, let's ask a question before you all fall asleep. Uh, it's getting quite hot in here. But... Yeah. We decided to wake everybody up. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> question? Come on. There's nothing whatsoever. All experts in my image reconstruction. That's great. All right. Yes. Okay. Question. Good. Uh, simple question. It wasn't mentioned, but uh, uh, for acceptable. I thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question, maybe a clarification. You didn't mention if there are any methods to uh, reconstruct attenuation maps from MRI, so for fatimer accommodation. Are there any, um, um, yeah, so there are several methods. Is anything already approximately uh, programmed in the toolbox? And the second one also for parallel imaging. What types of parallel imaging is available? Yeah. Um, great questions. Um, I will start with the parallel imaging because there have some good news. Um, so for this, we have um, basically Sense and Grappa is implemented. So the most common um, parallel imaging techniques. Um, as you have seen, if you have seen from that onwards, then uh, any kind of um, regularized sense or so on is also possible, like the, the TV regularization I showed you. Um, regarding the attenuation map, no, we haven't got anything in there yet. Um, because yeah, calculating attenuation maps from our data is not such a trivial task. Um, and so we haven't got anything there. Yeah, contributions <laughs> or pointers to somewhere else that we can still in open source uh, spirit would be really good to make it more complete. Any other questions? Yes.
Um, so, so my, my question is uh, with regards to uh, when trying to do uh, simultaneous uh, like pattern MRI system, when you're trying to do the alignment of the attenuation maps of, you know, not just the subject, but all the other features as well, um, what specific uh, softwares and computation methods are you utilizing when you're trying to execute something like that when you're trying to combine the raw pet and raw MRI data? I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but I think the question was that how, how do I do the alignment between MR and uh, MR based attenuation map and, and PET data, right? Um, in, mo in most cases, um, your best choice is doing an additional registration. Um, so in all the examples we have, this is what we are doing. Um, and again, you can use the nifty reg uh, functionality, which we have in there, um, which allows you to to um, yeah, make sure that, that um, the tonation map and the PET um, data is then really in alignment. Yeah, we, we, um, we struggle at the moment a little bit with uh, getting the coordinate systems between the PET and the MR lined up um, for two reasons. One, we arguably we have a bug on the PET side in third that it doesn't take that position into account. And the other reason is that every manufacturer has their own somewhat private fields on, on this alignment between the two countries. And we aim to put that in there, but in the end, more than likely you have some uh, movement between your actual component parameters in the end, and uh, a rigid or maybe a fine registration is what we do in practice. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we should move on. Uh, if you were you planning to show uh, on the notebooks anything at all, or is this about it, Crystal? Yeah, I wanted to show you the notebook, but I think yeah, we should leave that. I think if you are getting quite hot, um, and we have we have more time for your projects. Um, but I would like to, if you are interested, please have a look at the notebooks. Um, there are also in the MR ones, there's lots of explanation also in there. So there are really a lot of comments, especially the early ones. Um, and if you are have experience with PET reconstruction or spec or CT and you want to learn about the MR, please have a look at the synergistic ones. I think they give you a very good introduction in kind of what certain aspects mean in PET than in MR it should make it quite easy to translate between the two uh, modalities if you also want to get more uh, information about the MR reconstruction. 